guys really have taught me more than you will ever know. Um, but enough about me. We have a great presentation tonight with uh, Father John Carchi. He is a priest from the Archdiocese of Chicago and astrophysicist. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, Father John, but organizing theology on tap is kind of like putting together a party in space. We have to plan it. <laughs> I think there's two more throughout the talk, so have plenty to drink, please. So let us begin as we do all good things. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come to our aid, O God of the universe, for you are the author of life and life itself. Jesus Christ, your resurrection destroyed death and removed the rock from your tomb. We joyfully ask that you remove the rocks from our hearts and our minds. We ask your blessing upon Father John as he teaches us the marriage of faith and science. May we learn day after day to take up the story and night after night to make known the message that God is a loving creator of things visible and invisible. We ask this through the intercession of Mary, the Theotokos, the God-bearer. Amen. Amen. So, a quick bio of uh, Father John is a native of the Chicago area and a priest of the Archdiocese of Chicago. Since his ordination in 2002, he has worked in young adult ministry in both Chicago and Washington, D.C. He is currently assigned at Mundelein Seminary, which I will be moving into tomorrow morning. He uh, teaches courses on scripture and on the relationship between theology and science. Father John holds a doctorate in Biblical Studies from the Catholic University of America and a doctorate in Astrophysics from the University of Chicago. With an applause worthy of a Big Bang, <laughs> please welcome Father John. All those jokes, we have a very special room reserved for Chip. I guarantee you. Uh, let's see. So before we dig in, I just want to draw our attention to what we just did, namely in the prayer that we said. You know, if you were listening to that, it was really a very beautiful prayer, Chip, talking about, yes, God, but in a very particular way, imploring that he would protect us, be our savior, help us. He talked about rocks, take rocks away from our hearts, alluding to the fact that you know it isn't just God, but there's this person named Jesus, and rocks were taken away from his tomb. What I'm getting at here is when we pray as Christians, we imply all sorts of things about God, how God relates to us, how God cares about us, how we might approach God, what God has done historically. But I find all too often when I go to these faith science talks, and it's a whole cottage industry, you read books about it, that kind of God is rarely the God that we talk about. We talk about, yes, a creator, but it's a creator of what undergrounds the laws of physics or how are we responsible for, you know, being in itself. It never gets to that personal level that we tend to pray with when we're down on our knees because there's something really significant in our hearts. And so if nothing else tonight, I want us to try and really break down that wall that often exists in the two different ways we talk about God. Because I'd like to suggest that if the whole faith science dialogue means anything, it ought to feed that very real human desire that we have to relate to this God that we're talking about. So did God create the universe? That's wonderful. But is that the same God I can somehow intimately encounter when my heart is breaking, when I'm fearful, when I'm feeling joy. It's not enough, I'm gonna, I don't wanna blast the neighborhood. <laughs> it's not enough, I would suggest, just to say, you know, I've got this God who is somehow related to the metaphysical necessities of creation. Okay, so, I believe in one Higgs boson, through him all things were made. You may not be up on the Higgs boson, it was all the rage now a little bit over a year ago, Something to do with particle physics, um, a lot of hoopla, rightly so, was given to it in the sense that it really helped take one step further along the road of understanding 
you know, what's often known as the standard model of uh, the standard model of particle physics. And so I'm just going to, rather than try to give a, a rundown myself, I'm going to have us watch a very brief video. Uh, Fermilab, that's our own local particle accelerator, now sadly shut down for that purpose, but it's still an active research place. And so one of their uh, particle physicists is going to tell us a little bit about the Higgs boson. I want to warn you in advance, he's dressed the way all professional physicists are dressed. So he has a t-shirt and jeans on, but over that he's put a blazer. And so when you see a physicist with a blazer on over his t-shirt, that's basically prom night. So this is as formal as it ever gets, which should let you know how important the news. I would also add, this video was made one year before the announcement of the discovery. So the announcement was made on the 4th of July, 2013, or 2012 rather. This was literally almost one year prior, but you can see already the data was kind of in the air and everyone knew something was coming along the way. So, you know, outdoor technology is always a little tricky, but let's see what we can do. If you've had any interest in physics at all, you've heard about a thing called the Higgs boson. But just what is it, and why is it interesting? In 1964, a physicist by the name of Peter Higgs took some ideas that were floating around at the time, added an insight or two of his own, and proposed that there was an energy field that permeated the entire universe. This energy field is now called the Higgs field. The reason he proposed this field was that nobody understood why some subatomic particles had a great deal of mass, while others had little, and some had none at all. The energy field that Higgs proposed would interact with the subatomic particles and give them their mass. The very massive particles would interact a lot with the field, while massless particles wouldn't interact at all. To better understand the idea, we can use the analogy of water and swimmers. In our analogy, the water serves the role of the Higgs field. A barracuda, being supremely streamlined, interacts only slightly with the field and can move through it very easily. The barracuda would then be similar to a low-mass particle. In contrast, my buddy Eddie, no stranger to donuts, can only move very slowly through the water. In our analogy, Eddie is a massive particle made massive by interacting a lot with the water. The lightest of the familiar subatomic particles is the electron, while in the subatomic world, the king of mass is the top quark. It weighs about as much as an entire atom of gold, about 350,000 times more than the electron. I'd like to stress that we believe the top quark is not more massive because it's bigger. It's not. In fact, we believe that both the top quark and the electron are exactly the same size. Indeed, they both have zero size. The top quark is more massive than the electron simply because it interacts more with the Higgs field. Actually, if the Higgs field didn't exist, neither of these particles would have any mass at all. Now, in the press, you don't hear about the Higgs field, but rather the Higgs boson. How are these two things related? The Higgs boson is the smallest bit of the Higgs field. To understand how that works, we should again return to water. Everyone knows what water is. If you're immersed in it, you know that water is everywhere. It's a continuous medium, and there are no holes in it. We also know that water is made of molecules, specifically H2O. If you hold these two ideas in your head with the realization that water consists of countless individual molecules, you can now begin to appreciate the Higgs boson. The Higgs field that gives subatomic particles their mass is made of countless individual Higgs bosons, just like water is made of individual molecules. You should keep in mind that the Higgs boson hasn't been discovered yet, and what I'm describing is simply the most popular idea as to why subatomic particles have the masses that they do. As I speak,
my colleagues and I are studying data taken at huge particle accelerators to see if this idea is true. Stay tuned. Okay, thanks very much. And now let me get my blazer. No. <laughs> so, um, go ahead and flip to the next slide. The Higgs boson generated a whole bunch of fun memes, and this was my favorite. I don't really know what that is, but I respect the fact that they discovered it. All right. Uh, just leave the slide there for a minute. So just a quick word about, you know, kind of, all right. just a quick word about what got me here. Interestingly enough, St. Clement's is part of my roots. I celebrated my first mass here. I uh, was very involved, not unlike Chip, in my seminarian days. Uh, so it's always been a very vibrant community. But before coming there, I was involved, as the introduction alluded to, uh, as a graduate student in astronomy and astrophysics. And so back in that day, most of my time was spent thinking about things like this. I was passionate about it, it's what really moved me. And the thing I always say to people, if you're thinking about vocation, whether it's to religious life or you know, investment banking or whatever, is ask yourself the question, what keeps you awake at night? You know, as you're drifting off to sleep, I don't care what you were working on during the day, I don't care what kind of great meeting you have coming up, what is it that you're thinking about, you know, and I don't mean some particularly exciting day coming up, but just in general, what's keeping you awake at night? So if we go to the next slide. Okay, so there I was, whatever, 15 years ago, and no Quakey Kakwoa or whatever her name was, that's when I was keeping me <laughs> awake at night. Um, but that, you know, if you don't know, that's the cast of the Big Bang Theory. I never thought that would become the topic of a sitcom, but it actually has. So anyways, we were working on, so working on problems like, it's not showing up too well, but on the right there, the, that's a galaxy with the radio jet shooting out of it. So basically, uh, the kinds of things that I was interested in was how galaxies form. And this was around the time NASA was putting up some really great telescopes, so we were getting all kinds of data coming in. It was a wonderful time to be in astronomy. Well, I was born and raised Catholic, probably like a lot of you, you know, not necessarily everybody here. And I found myself at that time in my life, early 20s, and the well had kind of run dry. And I had a lot of the same thoughts and questions most people have. You know, questions about love, about purpose, what's life all about, why are horrible things happening in the world. And I was pretty much carrying with me the faith that I had from Catholic grammar school. And I'd worked so hard on, you know, astrophysics and all that other stuff, but I hadn't really made an attempt to allow my faith to mature. And I remember coming to a point, I remember very distinctly, it was on the eve of Lent one year, and I basically said, you know, this is the time. I'm either going to get something out of this or I'm going to chuck it. And that was a very scientist-y way to approach a question like that. I could not with integrity walk away from that without really knowing what I was walking away from. It wouldn't have been fair for me to say, well, you know, Sister Mary Jones in the fifth grade didn't really float my boat, so therefore Catholicism must be silly or God must not exist. That wouldn't be fair. As a scientist, that wouldn't be fair to approach any sort of a problem. And so I kind of just laid it down the gauntlet to myself on that Ash Wednesday that either I was going to, you know, really dig into this in a mature way and discover that for the last 2,000 years, there must have been something there sustaining people, or in fact, there really wasn't anything, and then I could walk away uh, with confidence. So as often happens, you know, you start going to daily mass or getting a little bit more involved, and people notice, right? Just like we called out whoever it was, raised their hand about vocations, mm -hmm. and you know, 250 of your closest friends are encouraging you. So eventually, I was at the parish down there in Hyde Park, 
And somebody approached me and said, you know, we see you around here a lot. We really need help with Eucharistic ministers. Big hospital, University of Chicago, down on the south side. Um, we were the parish, the local parish, and lots of Catholics there. You know, they need someone to come bring them communion. I knew nothing about that. I was terrified, you know, uh, I looked like one of those guys in the back row. The last thing I would be comfortable doing is walking into a stranger's room and talking to them about God. But, you know, this is always a journey, right? And the Lord clearly was working in my own heart. Whether or not it would lead to me being here, at least that sense of, no, I want to be involved. I want to try and be helpful if I at all can. Though I had absolutely no, you know, sense at all that I was going to be this words of wisdom for the people I was going to see. So you go through a little training, and as it so happened, I wound up mostly on the oncology ward, and I didn't have the hip hairdo there, the glasses that he has, but just going into these rooms and being face-to-face -face with folks many of whom were, you know, looking mortality in the eye, not all of them necessarily. But what blew me away was the conversations that I would have with them. And I don't want this to sound overly clinical. I mean, I'm always a little cautious when I talk about it this way, but I've got to be honest with you. There was something of the scientist in me that was fascinated by those conversations. I mean, to be sure, these were interpersonal conversations, and I really grew to love these people, and I really hoped that some of the fears in their own hearts would be met, and I wanted all of them to be healed. That certainly didn't always happen. But what fascinated me was the way they would talk about their faith, and how that had almost no correlation with what they'd been doing with their life. So I can literally picture in my mind right now some of the sweet little old ladies who, you know, went to Mass every day, they were involved in the parish all their lives, they worked and slaved to put their kids through Catholic school, and they were mad as hell because here they were right now, and this is how they were ending their life, or the life of someone they loved, and they were there at the bedside. How could God do this to them? How could this possibly happen after they've done so much in their own faith? And there are other guys who were admittedly, you know, just moral rogues, and they'd say, you know, I never went to church, I never believed in God, I cheated on my taxes, I cheated in my marriage, da 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 But, as I'm sitting here now, you know, and this wasn't like the, the classic uh, confession in a foxhole kind of thing. I mean, I remember one guy literally saying, you know, yeah, I might be getting closer to God now, but he'll probably still send me to hell. I understand that. But I just, you know, but he said, but I want to talk about that. I want to know. I, yeah, I grew up Catholic. I kind of knew some of these things. But so as I would go back, you say, what keeps you awake at night? Increasingly, I was thinking less and less about the little galaxies there on the right, though I would have said those are absolutely fascinating. I never got to the point, and I'm certainly not there now, where I say, oh, you know, physics, it's boring, it's silly. No, it's fascinating stuff. But increasingly, I was thinking about those conversations as I sort of drifted off to sleep. And that part of my heart that was always drawn to the unknown and what's underlying this and how did we get here, that's what was being spoken to. In no different a way, really, than what was being spoken to when all I could think about for myself was, you know, a future in astrophysics with NASA. Now about this time, so about the early to mid 90s, John Paul II's really getting into his stride as the Pope. He came out with one of his many encyclicals called Veritatis Splendor, The Splendor of Truth. And I just remember that was the perfect time for me to get that document. Because think of the title itself, The Splendor of Truth. And in it he goes through basically the human thirst for knowledge, you know, we have all the right words in our faith. I am the way, the truth, the life. But what does that mean? You know, and when I would get up and I'd go to the library, sit in front of my computer, and the you know, truth, we're exploring truth, science will help us understand truth. Was I still thinking I am the way, the truth? No. It's like that was the Jesus part of my brain. We'd say that in church, and this was the science part of my brain. And documents like that and sort of what was transforming in my own heart at the time was forcing those two things to be in dialogue. There's only one truth, there's only one love, you and I only have one heart, and there's only one God. So how does all this stuff kind of meld together in the one pot that I think we falsely break down into this dialogue of faith and science? So that's what was going on for me. Eventually, I got to the point where I said, you know, I can't live with integrity without pursuing this further. But I was human, you know, I finished the degree, I did a postdoc, I was like, well, I want to really make sure that I can do this. But eventually, you know, it's Fisher cut bait, and 
but that's about where I was in my own mind and heart when I went off to seminary. But it's that idea of what keeps you awake at night and you can't really ignore it. But that's how I got to be kind of where I am now. I'd like to issue tonight a manifest blazer and t-shirt, but what does it say to that? What does it say to the kinds of things where I often get on my knees and say, oh my God, what does it say to when I'm actually praying to God? When I'm actually wondering if God cares or if God is there? Whatever I might learn about God from Higgs boson scattering, it's got to say something to what's on the right-hand column there. Otherwise, I'm living with two gods, you know, or I'm pretending that there's two different ways of looking at the world. Obviously, I'm physically physics-y biased, but if you're a bi biological person, I'll pray for you. But nevertheless, <laughs> you have the double helix there. Okay, that's something to do with molecules. Well, what does that have to do with... I, I wanted a picture of marriage, and you know, so there's a billion happy couples. You know, if you don't know who the, that couple is, who are they? The yeah, good. So, <laughs> if you've never seen the film The Graduate, uh, before you wake up tomorrow, go see it. And, and anyway, so it ends with a famous wedding scene that doesn't quite well, it doesn't get anywhere near consummation. It doesn't even get to exchange of vows. But I love it. Uh, I love it simply because it's all about relationships. And if you see the movie, you'll understand my point just, if what we understand about God through the faith science dialogue, it has to speak to who we are as human beings. And that means it has to speak to our capacity for relationships. It has to speak to our capacity for love, to give it, to receive it, to reject it, to be afraid of it. All the kinds of things that interest all of us here, you know. I looked at the sponsor, Burwood Tap, right? Okay, well, that's what's going on there on any given Friday, Saturday night. People wanting to meet other people, wanting to enjoy time with other people, nervous, afraid, you know, overly aggressive, all the rest of it. <laughs> Does the double helix have anything to do with that? Well, I mean, in a silly way, I guess you could say we act out of our genetic structure. But my point is just and we'll get to this a little bit later, what Christians say about God is not just some generic statement about a higher power. What we say about God is very much intimately involved with things like love, relationship. So if we're going to talk and put effort into understanding more about God through the faith science dialogue, it's got to say something to something like marriage or love or friendship. I know you probably can't see, it's Richard Feynman on the lower left corner there. And I looked at it, I said, wow, it looks like he's holding up a chalice. But there he's teaching in Caltech. Um, if you don't know about Feynman, look him up. He's got uh, videos on YouTube and stuff. A very interesting character. Someone who would love these kinds of conversations because everything was fair game to him. Either you have a brain or you don't. And if you do, then everything is worth talking about. Well, if we learn something about God, again, in and through any sort of science dialogue, what does that have to say to something like the Mass or all our, all our sacramental realities? And again, back in the day, when you could simply have this rather comfortable you know, separation between physics and metaphysics, so transubstantiation, right? Now everybody has to, has to use the word or get comfortable with consubstantial. Those are great terms, but don't hide behind them with metaphysical smoke. So whatever transubstantiation means, yes, we understand the molecules of the bread and the wine don't change. I get that. But what does change? You know, you're not allowed to say, well, nothing actually changes, then I don't care, okay? It doesn't have to be a physics change. It doesn't have to be a chemistry change. But if you're understanding it through your brain, then something is actually changing. Maybe it's the way you understand, maybe it's the way you think, maybe it's your capacity for love. But if you're just gonna stay so hands off, you know, this is the most important thing in the world, great. Well, how is it really involving you? Well, you know, transubstantiation. Okay, wonderful, what does that mean? Well, it's metaphysics. You've lost me, okay? So how do these things begin? Without going to goofy statements like, oh, does the host weigh a little bit more after it's been consecrated? And no, <laughs> science can help us dispel all that nonsense, and so it's, it's useful in that way too. <laughs> so I'd like to suggest at kind of the most base level, but a very powerful level, is that physical evidence, just physicality, stuff, looking at it, understanding it, you know? You'll never see me with my sleeves rolled down. This is my favorite thing. You gotta roll up your sleeves and dig in, okay? So I'm that guy at the party, right? I extend my arm in my blazer and you see skin. It's so embarrassing. So, so here you go. You roll up your sleeves, you dig in. Uh, next slide, please. The power of physical evidence, okay? God ain't bringing you that pony, kid, so get over it. 
So the top there is William Blake's famous etching, right? God, the creator God. Um, and the bottom is the banning of My Little Pony. So I grew up with four sisters, so you don't know how much joy I had putting that not sign over My Little Pony. Um, but here's my point. I think maybe for you it wasn't a pony, but all of us can relate to childhood where, you know, all we've heard growing up, God is good, God is loving, God loves you. Okay, great, you know. Well, my mom and dad didn't love me enough to give me that pony in the backyard or whatever, so all right, God, please, please, please let there be a pony. Please, God, please let there be a pony. I'll be so good, God, let me be your pony. And all we're hearing is this constant, God is love, God loves you, God won't let anything bad happen to you. When something good does happen, see how much God loves you. Well, any good, self-respected kid says, I want to, you know, multiply this investment. So, God, let there be a pony, let there be a pony. And you wake up, there's no pony. You wake up, there's no pony. You wake up, there's no pony. At some point in your childhood, you know, it's a critical moment. And I almost wish we could, like, record it. At some point in every kid's life, you realize, there ain't going to be no pony. You know, I'm not going to say that prayer today. And then the ball starts rolling and you know, can lead to all different sorts of areas. The value, one of the most important values, I think, of science is that it can knock the legs out from under what faith has never really been offering in the first place. And because we're human beings and we have deep desires and hopes in our hearts, we're gonna take, we're gonna take what we think about God and we're gonna say, it should look like this. I want it to look like that. How could it possibly not look like this? But we have to accept the reality of the world that we see. And so whatever God's infinite goodness is, we know it doesn't look like the pony in the backyard. It doesn't look like every baby with cancer getting cured. It doesn't look like every broken marriage getting healed. It doesn't look like every alcoholic or addict, you know, suddenly having newfound freedoms. And that is an undeniable truth. That's the way the world is. Now you're at a crossroads, okay? Now you have to make a choice. So you either say, well, this obviously proves there's no God, or this obviously proves God doesn't love me, or this obviously proves whatever. But a scientist would jump in and say, look, whether I believe in your God or not, you've just done some really awful science there. You know, you wouldn't make other decisions in your life based on that kind of, you know, what's the word I want? I don't know, bad, bad way. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't do it that way. Why are you just chucking this out based on what is understandably very real disappointment? And here's where a scientist would jump in and say, okay, look, you have a set of data here. I understand that. But Jesus never said, you know, pray for a pony and it'll be in the backyard. Then people jump in, ah, but Jesus does say, ask and you will receive, knock and it will be given. Well, the people he was talking to weren't morons, okay? Peter didn't get everything he ever wanted. I mean, long before Jesus died or left after the resurrection, it's not as if everybody got everything they ever wanted. So they themselves had to wrestle with that basic statement. Okay? And so, something that science can contribute a lot to, I like to say, that I do a lot of spiritual direction, a lot of spiritual direction with young adults, if you're interested, come talk to me, but you can do this with your friends. The value of science, and one of the most important things we need to do, is you need to kill the God who doesn't exist. And I'd suggest as we grow up, we all have some remnant of a false God living in our hearts. And some of us feed that God, you know, and he grows to very large proportions, you know, some of us not so much. But you've got to kill that God, and you've got to kill him as quickly and as thoroughly as you possibly can. Otherwise, the God that does exist is never really going to take root in your heart. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So, there I'm trashing my little pony, and you have the right to be offended. <laughs> let's just go to some cold, hard facts. Okay? What's that top number there? Anyone... Nail that for me. Uh, it's close. Louder. No, what did you say? Uh, Avogadro's number. Louder. Avogadro's number. Prouder. <laughs> Avogadro's number. Avogadro's number. Thank you very much. Um, so 6.02 times 10 to the 23. I didn't write in the other. Uh, and so someone else said it's a mole, right? annoying things, they chew up your lawn, and whoever knew there were so many of them. The point is, when the subatomic world enters the real world, like we're used to, that's the order of magnitude of things that are involved. So, like a breath of air, basically has somewhere on the order of 6 times 10 to the 23, you know, hydrogen molecules in it. 
you know, or, or oxygen law, a little bit less of the oxygen, but so here's my point. Earth does not make oxygen. You know, we all hear that all oh, the plants make oxygen. Well, the plants recycle the oxygen that they get from carbon dioxide and all that stuff. We don't make oxygen. Okay, oxygen is a, is a for astronomers, it's what's called a heavy element. Anything heavier than hydrogen is considered heavy for astronomers. But this stuff is made, near as we can tell, in explosions of stars and supernovae. At any event, we can say with great confidence, you know, we're not making oxygen on planet Earth. All the oxygen that we have, and there's a lot of it, it's just getting recycled. It's getting recycled over time, okay? Well, every time you take a breath, there's something on the order of, you know, look, that's a honk and a lot of zeros. 6.02 times 10 to the 23 of these. Now think of how many breaths you take in a lifetime. So, a calculation almost everybody does in freshman physics class. Uh, you know, if you didn't, you went to the wrong school. Um, <laughs> but it's a very simple calculation to show that, you know, over the, the surface of the globe, given the, the length of time that Homo sapiens have been around, um, that as you take a breath, you are almost certainly, certainly over the course of a lifetime, you are inhaling and then processing through your body some of the same oxygen molecules that basically any other person who ever lived is. Um, so lots of times they'll pick someone like Shakespeare or Abraham Lincoln. Um, and if this is just blowing your mind, I guess you have to trust me, but maybe what'll help it be blown a little bit less is just how enormously big Avogadro's number is. You know, I don't think we can quite appreciate how huge. So if you've got that many of anything and you're kind of dispersing them over the world, especially if they're things like oxygen in the atmosphere. Okay, so my point is this. Every time you take a breath with almost as much certainty as you can have of anything, if not every breath, let's at least say over the course of your lifetime, you are inhaling and taking into use some of the very same oxygen atoms that were part of Jesus of Nazareth, okay? Similarly, there's oxygen in bread, there's hydrogen in bread, there's carbon in bread, okay? What do we know about that? Well, again, at the molecular level, that's not locked down. Little molecules of bread are jumping off and falling back on constantly. If you could look at, at a small enough level, it's a very busy place. And in particular, some of those little molecules just get knocked off and they go into the air and they, they settle on different parts uh, of the room or, or the planet or whatever. Okay, I was in Israel earlier this year for 10 weeks. I, maybe some of you went on the St. Clement trip not too long ago. When you go to a place like Israel, I mean, people would give their right arm to be able to be at the spot where Jesus stepped, you know? And, and unfortunately, when you go over there, you'll find 20 different places where Jesus did the same thing and, and everybody has a different stake to it. But still, some of those sites that, you know, it's very humbling, it's very moving to know that Jesus was in this area. You go up to Galilee, you see the, the Lake of Galilee, Sea of Galilee, all the rest of it. But my point is people have fought and died over, you know, the ability to have control over this spot or that spot. Or, you know, people said, look, this is a part of the actual cross or the Shroud of Turin. Well, what does it mean to those people? And they couldn't have known this, you know, a couple hundred years ago but they know it now if they're willing to not have their minds close to it. What does it mean to them to say, oh, you know, 6,000 of your soldiers just died trying to, you know, hold control of this square patch of land in Jerusalem? Well, you've got, you know, about 70,000 of Jesus' atoms in your body. Does that change anything for you? I mean, does that make a sacred spot different the way you look at it? This is maybe where Jesus stepped you've got his atoms all over your body, you know? And all that I'm saying is, I don't think, I don't think we've allowed that for people who, for some people for whom the, the actual sacred relic is so precious, science adds something to that saying, well, what is the value of the relic that you have? And what about the, not necessarily relic, the actual things that constituted Jesus' own body? That's inside of you. I'm not saying they should understand it one way or the other. I'm simply saying I think it incredibly adds a lot to the conversation over what is a sacred space or what isn't a sacred space. How about the Eucharist, okay? Eucharist, very sacred, holy, you know? You don't have to convince me of that. But sometimes people will receive the Eucharist and they'll very respectfully take it, that's okay. Some people will lick their hands, you know, some people will look very carefully to make sure there's nothing there. If a little piece happens to fall on the floor, you know, and it's big enough to be picked up, 
it should be picked up, but you know, other people, are, well, maybe there's something that I can't see and they'll just kind of wipe. Well, what if you told these people, guess what? There are pieces, there are molecules of this host all over the room, up on the ledges in the church. How often do you think you know, a church cleans the ledges way up at the top? You know, St. Clement's, the other side of the rose window. It isn't just, you know, rabbit fur that gets floating up there. Part of that very really, you know, are molecules from a consecrated host. Does that change at all your understanding of a sacred space? And I'm not being disrespectful at all in this. But again, I've seen people, you know, they're willing to, to kill over sacred space in front of a monstrance, and they should deeply, deeply reverence that space. But how about, you know, when you're not there? Well, that's the real, you know, that's the consecrated host. Science will not let you off the hook. If it's the actual transubstantiated species of the molecules of bread, that ain't just in the monstrance. And I'm not simply saying, well, Jesus is everywhere. I mean, I'm saying something at a very physical level. Because people will kneel in front of the monstrance, and they get that Jesus is everywhere, but in a very potent way, he's physically there. And all that I'm saying is, science forces you to admit something that Thomas Aquinas couldn't have dreamed of. But I'd love to know what he would have said. And does that perhaps influence the way we look at the world when we leave the Adoration Chapel? Right, next slide. So the, there's a scientific method and a path to holiness. That's what I'm saying here. That scientists have learned to live with the dis-ease and the endless surprise of uncommon sense. They look for it. They try to understand it. They're fully alive when they engage it. And exposing a hopeless failure can constitute a good day's work. They get energized when everything seems to fall apart because at least that's telling them something fundamentally new. So when people were looking for the Higgs boson, they were saying, look, if we don't find something here, that means we really have to rethink the way we understand the world around us. But that's okay. And I'd say too many Christians cling to what they think they know about God not much of which, much of which has not been updated since their childhood, and their worst nightmare is letting go of divine familiarity, if I can put it that way. I'll jump ahead, uh, this one and then the next one as well. Uh, or go back one, sorry. So science rests on the belief in certain universal constants and fundamental laws. So charge on the electron, the speed of light, that's the gravitational constant. These are... Maxwell's equation, that's Einstein's equation on the right. Okay, very nice, very beautiful. But these are the fundamental axioms that any scientist has to work with. And biologists would have their own set, and chemists would have their own set. Go to the next slide. What scientists do is they take those basic underlying constants and they push them. They push them as far as they possibly can go, and they're never satisfied without pushing them. That's the excitement of the scientific endeavor. You're waking up every morning, and you're just pushing as hard as you can on what you already know because you couldn't think of anything more wonderful or engaging than seeing where might this go tomorrow? So in particular, the thing that led to the discovery of the Higgs boson was something called the standard model of particle physics that was built up over you know, a couple of generations just by scientists pushing on what they already knew. And our friend Peter Higgs, he turned up in the video very briefly. He was a young man, now he's you know, a senior, but he lived to see it. That came from pushing on what we have. Well, how about faith? Next slide. Christianity rests on certain universal revealed truths. And I'm giving a lot of thought to this, and these are my big four. You know, maybe there's five, maybe there's three, but then I'd be wrong. So there's obviously four. <laughs> and I think the number one thing is God is love. Okay? Now that's nice. You can you know, put it on a pin cushion, wonderful Hallmark card. We've all heard it all our lives. But just like some of those physical constants, you know, what happens if you push on it? Not God is loving, though he is. Not God is lovable, though he is. But God is love. You can spend the rest of your life trying to understand what that means. Go to the Burwood Tap and just throw the question around. What is love? What is love? Boy, are you going to get interest. Tension, okay? God is love. But that's a fundamental axiom. God is a trinity of three divine persons in one being. We didn't reason to that. That's a piece of revealed truth, okay? But if it's true, then what does that say about God and what does it say about us? The Paschal Mystery. Nobody reasoned to that. That's revelation. What do I mean by the Paschal Mystery? That God became us. That that God become us actually died, 
and that that God who became us and died, you know, rose from the dead. Very nice, very nice phrase. We rattle it off in the creed, but why is that relevant? Why is it important? And then finally, that human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. Okay, so next slide. Well, if those are your axioms, and now you push them the way a scientist pushes, you know, first the way Newton looked at the world, then the way Einstein looked at the world, then the way Feynman looks at the world, then the way Peter... What if you do that with the fundamental axioms of Christianity that I'd suggest we often don't do? You know, let the God with the pony go. Here's where the interest is. We are hardwired for loving relationship. We're hardwired. If we're made in the image and likeness of that Trinitarian God, then it's a requirement for being human. It's not just, well, Jesus said we should like each other, and that's probably a good way to be. Baloney. If you're not doing that, you are less than human with full integrity. Yes, you're still homo sapiens, but you're not fully human. We can only know God by interpersonal loving relationship with God. And that defines what prayer is. If your prayer, I don't care how respectful it is, but if your prayer isn't forcing you with brutal honesty to look God in the face, because God is a person, that's the definition of a person. It's a being with a face, a divine being, but still a being. If you can't look God eyeball to eyeball and say, Lord, this is what's in my heart. This is what I'm bringing. You know, yes, you made the universe. That's great. I'm so grateful for that. But I'm not going to tell you about the fact that, you know, I want to kill my kid or whatever because we're fighting so much. Or I'm not going to tell you about how envious or jealous I am or how bitter my heart is. Then that isn't prayer. You're not honoring that fundamental relational quality. If you came here tonight with a friend, you know that if you don't tell them what's fundamentally in your heart and you're having a conversation, you're never really going to be in a position to receive what they want to say to you. There's going to be something in the room that hasn't been mentioned. And if that goes for people's relationships, it certainly goes for God. Love is meant to be fruitful and faithful and forever. Okay? These are the, these are the primary qualities of sacramental love that you'll find in Catholic sacramental theology. That comes out of those axioms fruitful, Father, Son, and Spirit in that intertwined love of the Trinity. That's what gives rise to creation. I mean, I realize I'm throwing a lot out here, but if you sit down and study the theology of creation, you'll see that's one of the fundamental qualities of the essence of what Christians say about God. Well, guess what? If we're made in the image and likeness of that, then love is meant to be fruitful. That's one of the promises you make when a couple gets ready to be married sacramentally in the Catholic Church. And fecundity, fruitfulness, doesn't just mean having children. It means love itself is meant to be creative, whatever that looks like. Do you love your dog? Great. There should be something new that comes out of that relationship that wasn't there before you had the dog. I don't mean that comes out of the dog. I mean that comes out of your relationship <laughs> with them. Okay? Think about someone you love. It's a friend. It's a family member. It's your significant other. Maybe it's your spouse or your child. If you really love that person, you could name concrete things that are now a part of you and them as a result of your loving each other. When you experience that creativity, you don't need to be convinced that it's there. You know, faithfulness, you grow in confidence, confido, with faith, that's what confidence means. You have that as a result of trust deepening in relationship. And forever commitment, you can't just decide you're going to be committed as an act of will. That has to grow out of a growing relational trust. And by loving, then, we participate in God's identity. They used to say in the early church, and we've shied away from that, the goal, the goal of the spiritual journey is divinization. It's to become God. Not to become a member of the Trinity, but to participate in that essence by growing ever more perfect in love. And no, we're not there yet by a long shot. And then the Paschal mystery means we're not defined by our limitations. Uh, by our limitations and sufferings. Because the lie that creeps in to human nature is you are ultimately defined by what limits you. Now think about this for a minute. I mean, we don't live most of our lives just enjoying everything that we have as much as we possibly want. We live most of our lives thinking about how can I get more of what I need? How come I didn't get that? How come she has this and I don't? In fact, I lay this following challenge to you. Think of your favorite sin right now. Just think of it. Oh, man. Think of your favorite <laughs> sin. Just go there. Father told you to, favorite <laughs> sin, okay, favorite sin, you all study too much, I knew it, well, that's okay, so whatever your favorite sin is, 
I will bet you my exorbitant salary that you can trace that sin down to your fighting against a limitation. What do I mean? Um, none of you were thinking about lust, but let's say one of you were. <laughs> what is lust all about? It's not, oh, sex is bad, and you, you, know, you shouldn't think about it in a bad way. It's basically saying, I am limited by the fact that, you know, I want to have a relationship with whoever I want, and I have this annoying inconvenience that they happen to have a free will. And so consequently, they might not decide to think I'm as wonderful as I'm imagining they are. So, you know, I'm going to objectify them. I'm going to let them be whatever I want to, them to be. And that's what lust is all about. I mean, it's, it's objectifying what is meant to be a free will, a free entity. And once you do that, you know, now you're in control, right? Because you can be in control of your own objectification. And whatever you choose to do with those thoughts, you know, you think is your business, but that infects every other relationship you have, and that's a whole other talk. But the point is, let, let's say you're resentful. Well, what's the limitation there? Well, at some level, you think you ought to have what that other person has, and you don't. Or for some reason, you shouldn't have had to give up whatever another person, person took from you. Play this game with any sin at all. Push it, push it, push it, and you'll find it's our will knocking up against the limitation that we are not God. Now, the ultimate limitation, you know, is suffering and ultimately death. And the lie is that those are the things that define you. So beg, borrow, and steal. Do everything in your power to try and avoid those things. No, and I'm not a masochist. I'm not saying we should enjoy suffering. But the lie which says your suffering is the thing that defines who you are. Therefore, the more suffering you have, the less of a human being you are. Or that, yeah, we're all going to, my gosh, the, it's a whole industry trying to convince people that they're not going to die, right? And walk into any department store and the whole, go to the self-help section. You know, there's a book called How Not to Look Old. You know, I used to blissfully walk by it. Now I'm starting to look over my shoulder. <laughs> you know, there's all kinds of cosmetics. There's all kinds of diets. You know, basically telling people, you know, you're not going to die. And we all know that we are, but plays on that fear. So this will be the last slide. What is it that... So what do you see in the face of the inexplicable? When a physicist looks on the right-hand side at the scattering of the Higgs boson, he sees the emerging truth of the standard model for particle physics. The emerging truth. He hasn't proved everything, but there's an emerging truth here. Wow, everything we've been working at, everything we've been pushing, everything we've been studying, Look, something is coming through, like a face through the fog. And that's stirring up in him an even greater hope, for those of you who follow this stuff, a grand unified theory, that the standard model is just part of an even more encompassing way of understanding the universe. And that this discovery with the Higgs field is just another significant step in that direction. Well, can the Christian look into that? You know, Holocaust survivors, babies with cancer, broken hearts, you plug in your own picture of misery. And it doesn't have to be on this enormous scale. Whatever broke your heart yesterday or last week or last night or this afternoon, can a Christian look into this and see the emerging truth of the Paschal Mystery, which is all about saying the way God chose to honor you know, us, his creation, was by becoming one of us. In other words, saying this is the most intimate way you can be in relationship with me. And because of that, this son of mine is going to know all the limitations that you've known. He's going to suffer, his heart will be broken, he's going to question, he'll have doubts. As we say, alike like us in all things but sin. That means he was up against the same limitations you are, but he didn't accept the lie saying that would define him. Remember with the temptation in the desert? The only thing the devil does to Jesus is ask him to accept the lie of his limitations. If you are the Son of God, you know, jump down from this cliff and turn these stones into bread. You're not limited by your hunger. You can do all these other things, okay? The incarnation, God becoming us, taking on all the limitations and not being defined by them. Unfortunately, I think for a lot of us, and I'll just raise my own hand here up until very, very recently, and I still don't have my mind and heart wrapped around it, but Paschal Mystery, that's Easter. That's what Jesus did. Oh, that's great. He lived, he died, he rose, you know, St. Clement's, the Triduum, I'm, I'm there, you know, beautiful. Oh, I hope it's not one of those crummy parishes where they don't do the true to them well. You know, all this kind of goofy <laughs> stuff we said. Never really thinking the Paschal Mystery is what takes me into that without feeling like, you know, that's it. Maybe you win the lottery, you know, you grow up in Lincoln Park, or, or anywhere, almost anywhere in the United States, or maybe you lose the lottery and you wind up there. You know, is that what it's all about? 
And the Paschal Mystery stubbornly says, this isn't just about what happened to this guy 2,000 years ago. Because of those fundamental axioms, this has to apply to you, and it has to take you into that, and there's something that's emerging. Now, I know this is way more, you know, it's a whole other talk, it's a whole other life, but a scientist would look at those axioms of Christianity, even if he didn't believe squat about God, and he would say, if that's what you're telling me are your fundamental tenets, then I can tell you volumes about what this should mean for how you live your life, for what you do, how you understand the world, that goes way, way beyond, you know, Jesus loves you, if he loves you, it will be a pony in the backyard. And then a really tough question comes along, and maybe you're like I was, as that graduate student, uh, you know, I don't have a clue, because my sixth grade Jesus doesn't seem to say a whole lot about these grown-up kinds of problems and issues. So, uh, the last thing I'll just leave you with is flip ahead to the very last slide, if you would. Just keep going. All right. So tomorrow, the Feast of the Transfiguration. I know you all knew that. You all attended the Vigil Mass just before tonight. Um, feast of the Transfiguration. If you remember that feast, it's all about Jesus goes up on the mountaintop with Peter, James, and John, and in some miraculous way, he's transformed, and this light shines around him. Okay, and then it all goes away. Now imagine you're a scientist coming along saying, well, was that a scientific event or wasn't it? A lot of times people would say, well, um, let's go ask Jesus. Jesus, I, I understood you did this amazing thing. Would you do it again, please? You know, we, we'd like to confirm it. I've, I've got witnesses here. He said, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to do it again. Um, well, you know, did you leave burn marks on the grass where there's scorches on the rocks that we can go and see? Do you know this? Well, no. Did you record it? Did you videotape it? No, I didn't do any of that. So at one level, the scientist would say, that's not a scientific event. A real scientist would say, gee, it's too bad we don't have that particular evidence, but Peter, come here, buddy. This isn't just something you saw come out of left field. You know this guy. You've built up a relationship with him. Now you've had this revelation that you say you've had. If you live your life based on the revelation that's come from that, now tell me what's going on. Now, if that's part of your fundamental axiom about Jesus, that he's this guy that has clearly a lot more going on about him than I previously knew, that should be affecting the way you're in relationship with him, the way you're acting as you tell people about him. My point is that should have ripple effects in your life and the life of the early church. That's the way a scientist would get at that kind of a question, as opposed to just throwing up his hands and saying, well, I don't have a video of this thing, so obviously it didn't happen. And I would lay down that same challenge for all of us. Whether you're into the faith science debate or you're not, you live in a world you know, that's governed by that way of looking at the world. You turn on your radio in the morning, you know, or you put your app up, and you listen to the weather report. You know, I don't care if you're a poet who you know, only reads on sheepskin because modern books offend you. You are living in a world that's governed by science if you listen to a weather report. It's time for us to take the way scientists look at the world and really let it infuse what we say about our faith. And I guarantee you, I bet my huge salary on it, I guarantee you, if you start pushing yourself in that direction, it will bear spiritual fruits for you as well. Okay.